for me, and I pray that well, I know it's a blessing for everyone else as well. Um, I hope y'all don't mind. I'm taking my coat off. I'm getting a bit warm this morning. Um, and I'd like to ask if everyone would open their Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2. Um, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time uh, you've given us to come together to hear your word. And as we gather here, Lord, we gather humbly asking that you would uh, give us wisdom, uh, that you would help us to understand your word today and not be hearers only, but doers of your will, that you would be glorified in us and through us in all that we do. On this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, many of you may already, well, many of you do know this, that about a year ago, my mima had passed away. And of course, this was during this whole pandemic where things were on lockdown. And, and, and many of us, maybe we, you know, you share that common uh, event in your life that maybe you've lost a loved one during that time. And I know it's been hard on my family, and I'm sure in, in everyone's life is, that has lost loved ones during this time, and that it's been a hard time for all of us. Um. And I mention this because I wanted to say as I reflect on my Meemaw and her life, there was one thing about her life that I will always remember. And it was like growing up in her basement, there was this big table that she always had. And, and on that table, you know, she would work on jigsaw puzzles. And a lot of times she would get these really massive jigsaw puzzles. Um, And jigsaw puzzles, when you look at them, you know, you got the picture on the box, but then you dump it all out and you see all of these scattered pieces. And it can be intimidating uh, to look at this, you know, all of this chaos. And you're like, and this mess is supposed to present this beautiful picture. Uh, It can be intimidating to look at that. But then when you realize a few key principles, it's, you know, once once you understand these few key principles, it's, it's quite easy, really, to get to work and put together that jigsaw puzzle and and to get this beautiful picture. And that's something my my Mima always remember. That was something that was one of her hobbies. You know, she had a whole table devoted to it that she would spend, you know, she didn't she didn't always finish the puzzles in like one sitting, but she had that table there so that she work on a little bit at a time and 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 just whenever the the mood struck her, she'd go and she'd work on it. Uh, A few principles, like I said, that that helps you understand how to work on a jigsaw puzzle is, you know, one, you want to begin with the edge pieces. Uh, One, because when you compare all the pieces, the fewer pieces are the edge pieces because they just form the borders of the picture you're trying to put together. 
And, and they pretty much have that straight edge that you can easily recognize out of all of the different shapes. You know, so that's always the, the first thing you want to start with because it's so easy to say, okay, there's a system here. This goes with this. This goes with this. And it's easy to separate that first. The other thing you may do, of course, is you look at the colors. You know, oftentimes there's a lot of the jigsaw puzzles will be like flowers or snowscapes or things like that. And even in a snowscape, that can be challenging because if it's all snow, it's all white. But then you look at that there'll be shadows or buildings or things. And you, and you start to recognize that each of these different parts of the image, there's connections, there are similarities, and you might group your pieces and start separating the pieces with, okay, these colors go here, and these, these shadows look like they go here. And, and once you kind of, you, you figure all this out, then you start working on it, and you see how the pieces themselves, you know, fit, because that's one of the other things about the jigsaw puzzle. Um, the only way you're going to mess up is if you try to force two pieces to fit that don't. Um, I mean, they're pretty much cut to work, and, and, and the more you get done, the more confident you, you become because you start to see, okay, this is done, and this fits here, and this fits here, and this fits here, and you keep going, and you keep going, and then you have this beautiful picture to display. And I mentioned this as our opening illustration because I think as we look at this text today, one of the things that we see, again, it's it's a celebration that's happening in, in the, the Jewish community um, that has a historical significance for the Jewish people. And, and one of the things that you learn when you go back and you read through the Old Testament and you read through all of the festivals that God had given His people um, to adhere to year after year, you start to see pictures. You start to see pieces that connect. And when you put all of these things together... When you look throughout from, from Genesis all the way to Malachi in the Old Testament, um, you start to see a beautiful picture, and that picture is the picture of Jesus Christ. We begin looking here in chapter 2, verse 1. We begin with verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. You know, it's interesting that when you come to the book of Acts, you know, Acts is shorthand for Acts of the Apostles. But in reality, many have said this, that really it's not so much the Acts of the Apostles, but rather it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is really the central character in the book of Acts. And I say character because, again, as we understand God as the triune God in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit... The Holy Spirit is a person, not a thing. Um, and even I have to catch myself because sometimes I will use the pronoun it instead of saying he. Uh, and, and we need to remember again, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And the book of Acts begins after, you know, you have Jesus, he's ascended. Oh, he, Jesus, he's risen from the dead. He spent time with his disciples. He, he's about to ascend into heaven. And he tells the disciples to wait until... They receive power from on high. And, and of course, when Jesus leaves, Jesus leaves like 40 days after he's raised. And it's 10 days later that they receive the Holy Spirit. That's 50 days. 50 days from the Passover, from the crucifixion. 50 days. And the word Pentecost itself is the Greek name the, the word itself means 50 days, and it's the Greek name for the holiday known as, and I'm going to mispronounce this like I mispronounced all the cities just a while ago, uh, Shuvaot, or in English, the Feast of Weeks. And, it, and, and of course, and like I said, it, it derives its name from the fact that it occurs 50 days after Passover, and, and this is significant because in, in when you go back to the book of Exodus and you look at the history of the Jewish people, um, you have the Passover event where you know, here's the, the people of Israel, they're, they're in bondage, they're, they're slaves in Egypt, and, and God has delivered all of these different plagues to demonstrate His power over the Egyptian gods. Um, to demonstrate His power to His people, to, to deliver them from bondage and bring them to the promised land. The Passover itself, where, where the lamb's blood was put on the door, 
So that when the angel of death came to exercise God's judgment, those who had the Lamb's blood were spared from the judgment of God. Which, of course, we recognize that itself alludes to Jesus. But 50 days after this event, when God leads the people out of Egypt, they come to Mount Sinai. And it is at Mount Sinai that God bestows His law upon the people of God. This holiday, so, so you have this holiday in the Old Testament. Again, the events that, that set up the celebration, you have Passover, 50 days, you have um, the Feast of Weeks, you have Pentecost. This holiday was also one that coincided with the grain harvest which the grain harvest itself, which happens year after year, was also meant to serve as a reminder of God's deliverance from the bondage of Egypt. You find this, if, if you want to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 16. And this isn't the only place uh, in the Old Testament where you see this, but I specifically wanted to address, you know, look, to look at Ephesians, I mean, Deuteronomy 16, verses 9 through 12, where God says, You shall count seven weeks... Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you, At the place that the Lord your God will choose to make His name dwell there, you shall remember that you are a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. So again, you have God's Word with this harvest time, also reminding them of God's deliverance. It is not an accident that God chose the day of Pentecost as the day that He would send forth His Spirit. When you look at all of these Old Testament traditions that the Jewish people had, the traditions of the past were not given to merely reflect on God's past actions. I mean, certainly when we think of of memorials, it is a time to reflect on a past event. But there's also future and present day aspects to our remembrance of things in the past. God's deliverance of the people of Israel from their bondage points them to God's deliverance of all people from the bondage of sin through Jesus Christ. I mentioned the Passover where the lamb was slain and the blood was over the door. That points to the the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary on behalf of us poor sinners in need of salvation. Another thing to to think about, too, is we talk about, again, Pentecost being a reminder of God coming down at Mount Sinai and giving His law. At Mount Sinai, God gave His law written on tablets of stone. Whereas on this day of Pentecost, God writes His law on the hearts of His people through the filling of His Spirit. As foretold by the prophet Jeremiah, which if you look at Jeremiah 31... Verse 33, you have this promise from God where God's Word says this, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You may wonder why, you know, why that is. And, and, and I think really when you look at God's giving of the law in the Old Testament, God gave them the law on tablets of stone, but yet throughout the history of Israel, they failed to keep it. Which which teaches us, of course, the weakness of human nature. Which teaches us that there is a need for God Himself to intervene in our lives. And and that's precisely why you have that, that prophecy of Jeremiah pointing us to the reality of God pouring out His Spirit because the law itself cannot save us because it is not within us the strength to keep the law. So in order for God to deliver us, He 
pours out His Holy Spirit upon His people that we might have the law within. So God chose the day of Pentecost as this day to send forth the Spirit because it coincided with the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Not only that, when we look at this account in the book of Acts, God displayed His power on the day of Pentecost with signs that paralleled the events of Mount Sinai in order to prepare the Jewish people for hearing the gospel message. You know, when you read Acts chapter 2, as we're you know, looking through this, and I'm going to go through all of these different things that, happening, that happen, at first glance, it might be a little strange and confusing to us. But I want everyone to understand, again, when you read a lot of things in the New Testament, it's important to understand the Old Testament context as well, that there is a reason for the things that are mentioned. Verse 2 says, And suddenly there was a, from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they are sitting. That's an important detail to note. It also mentions... And it says, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. That too is a very specific detail that is worthy of note. You see, all of these things that are happening at the day of Pentecost are signs that parallel what happened when God's people came to Mount Sinai. Wind itself is a sign of God's Spirit and it's rooted in the fact that both in Hebrew and Greek, the word for wind is the same exact word as the word for spirit. Luke puts a particular emphasis in this text on the sound of the wind, which if you go back and you look in Exodus, when, when the people are at the mountain, God actually he speaks to them, and it's this mighty sound that terrifies the people in hearing it. It mentions divided tongues of, of of fire, and you may say, well, that's strange too, but even so, when you look through the Old Testament, fire itself was a symbol of the divine presence all throughout the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, God's presence was in the burning bush where Moses is there, and God speaks from the burning bush to Moses. In Exodus 13, 21, it, it speaks of God leading the people in the wilderness by cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In Exodus 24, 17, which is the Mount Sinai event, it mentions God's glory appearing as a devouring fire. And then, of course, in Exodus 40, 38, when you have the tabernacle or the tent of God where, where God was worshipped, um, it, it mentions God, God's presence being in the fire of the tabernacle that would appear by night. This event at Pentecost, as the apostles are there and the Holy Spirit comes down, it, 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 again, it, it's meant to call to attention the people looking back to, remember when God appeared at Mount Sinai? Remember when God came down to be with His people at Mount Sinai? Here He is at the day of Pentecost. Here He is again. God displayed His power that they might know here is the Lord. And of course, as we see further, God bestows upon them speaking in tongues. And it mentions all the manner of people that were there. People, you know, Jews from all over. People who, who spoke many different languages and maybe didn't understand each other. And all of a sudden, people are speaking languages that they had never learned. And hearing their own languages from people who never were taught other languages. And so all of a sudden, this happens. And you'll notice what it says that, that it's being said. You come to verse 11, it says, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And so what they're doing is they're proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has come down. It has is, is filled His people. They're proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And all of these Jews from all around the world who would have been divided by, by not having a common language, all of a sudden, everyone there is hearing the gospel of Jesus. Jesus. 
so that they may understand God and His goodness. That these signs of God's presence was there so that the people would recognize as they were preaching the good news of Jesus that this gospel of Jesus Christ is not some new doctrine or some false teaching, but this message of Jesus is God's message. That all of the events of the Old Testament, all of the ceremonies, all of the things that had been done, everything that is there pointed to Jesus Christ. The signs were given that they may know that the message was from God. And again, as we look to in this context, when it talks about the speaking in tongues, it is very clear that it's not just speak, people speaking gibberish, but rather actual languages. It mentions tongues and it mentions languages, and it's two Greek words. I'm going to mispronounce these. I think glossia, I think, where, where we get the English word glossary from, which means tongues. But you also have the word dialectus, which is where we get the English word dialect from, which means languages. It's clear in this context that what's happening is people are speaking languages they had never learned. You know, me, I, you know, one of the things, I have a love for languages myself. I'm, not, I'm only really fluent in English, and I'm not even that good at that, as y'all can tell. Um... You know, I could say things like, you know, Guten Tag, wie geht's? You know, it's German, Konnichiwa, Japanese, Anyang Haseo, Korean. Um, you know, I, I love all these different languages. And, and, and one of the things about it, language translation is that you can't just take words and, you know, a lot of people think of it, you have like a decoder ring and you just substitute, you know, letters. I don't know if anyone ever had those growing up or playing with those like in a Cracker Jack box. Where you might have like a code where really all they did was they took words and scrambled the letters and you just had to have a, a way of unscrambling the letters. And those were real fun to play with. And I think a lot of times we tend to think languages as you just substitute the words and then you can, you know, that's how it works. And this is unfortunately a problem of our own kind of culture. You know, m many places in the world people are multilingual because they deal with people of different language groups and things of that. And so people kind of, you know, even in Jesus' day, you have the fact that you have Greeks and, and Jews and the Hebrew, you know, the, the Jews spoke Aramaic and you have, the, the, you have Alexander the Great, when he conquered much of the world, he was forcing everyone to learn Greek. Then you have the Romans coming in, now everyone's got to learn Latin. So you got all of these different languages going around. And, and whereas we kind of in America... One language is usually all we know. So understanding translation is something that a lot of times we fail to really see how difficult that is. It's not easy to just go from one language to another. And I know Sebastian can testify to that as well, you know, being from Romania. Uh, it takes a lot of work communicating between people. But it is amazing that a message as important as the gospel of Jesus Christ was so vital that God performed a miracle in, on this particular day so that all of these different people with all of these different languages could hear and understand and know that Jesus Christ was Lord. And even, so you see this miraculous event, and even with these signs, there are people at the end of the text that says that they mock the disciples, and this of course prompts Peter to preach his message concerning the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy and how Jesus is both Lord and Christ. But again, as we look at this, I wanted us to understand, you know, first and foremost, again, God chose the day of Pentecost on purpose so that people would know that Jesus Christ was His chosen deliverer. That God displayed His power on the day of Pentecost with signs that paralleled the events of Mount Sinai. So again, they could know that this was a message from Him. And as we look at this event, it's important that we recognize as well that God acted in a unique way on the day of Pentecost. And while the events described, I don't believe, are meant to be prescriptive for the church today, we do realize that the Holy Spirit still empowers believers today to help build up God's church. I mentioned God acted in a unique way on the day of Pentecost. 
You know, and and I, I'm really saying this because I think there's a lot of confusion today on this subject when you look at the Pentecostal movement and things of that nature. And so I want us to look at this text and understand, really, what does the Bible teach on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Pentecost was a unique day. I mentioned all of these signs had a particular purpose and meaning, specifically at this point, to the Jewish people. When you look at the other occurrences of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, you will see that there really isn't a pattern that follows. In Acts chapter 8, 14 through 17, you have Samaritan believers. And again, if you know anything about the Samaritans and their relationship to the Jewish people, they did not get along. And in Acts chapter 8, you have these Samaritans who, who believe the gospel and are baptized you know, in, in accordance with you know, Christ's baptism, which when you see that in the book of Acts, think back to the book of Matthew where Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Because that's what is being meant by that. When he talks about the baptism of Jesus, it's talking about that Trinitarian baptism. And so you have the Samaritan believers... When you look at what happens with them, they hear the gospel, they believe the gospel, they're baptized, no Holy Spirit. And then, so the apostles hear about this, and Peter and John specifically, they go to the Samaritans, they lay hands on them, then the Holy Spirit is manifested in their speaking of tongues at that particular event. But then you look at Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48, and you have the Gentile believers. And what happens there is they're not even baptized. They hear the word of God and all of a sudden they're speaking in tongues. That doesn't fit at all what had happened earlier. But then you have Acts chapter 19 where you have the Ephesian believers. And they had been baptized, but they received the baptism of John, which was a baptism of repentance. They had not been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And so what happens? Well, Paul lays hand, you know, Paul basically says, okay, we need to straighten this out. You need to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And then, of course, Paul lays hands on them, and they too receive the Spirit. I, I mention all of these because as we read the book of Acts, it's important that we recognize there are things in Scripture that are descriptive, not prescriptive. All of these things, again, there's no pattern other than God pouring out His Spirit on the people. And God did it in a unique way in each of these occurrences for a purpose, and that purpose being that God Himself, in pouring out His Spirit, He was communicating to the early church that He had accepted these people. God poured out His Spirit on the Jews so that they would know God was with them. God poured out His Spirit on the Samaritans so that the Jews would know that God was with the Samaritans as well. God poured out His Spirit on the Gentiles so that the church would know that God had approved of the Gentiles too. And this ties back to the very beginning of Acts where Jesus Himself, you know, the message that they were given, they were called, you go back to chapter 1, so when they had come together, and this is verse 6, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and, in, and to the ends of the earth. And in this, you see, God has a concern for all people. And, this, and the sign of that is that God gives His Spirit to all people. And you see that kind of occurring distinctly in the book of Acts. And I mentioned those are descriptive things, what, not prescriptive. What is prescriptive, you find in Acts chapter 2 as well, at the very end of Peter's sermon, Peter says this, uh, after he preaches about Christ, and this is Acts chapter 2, verse, starting with verse 37. Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And I think some translations say, what shall we do to be saved? 
And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For, the, for two things he mentions. Forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the prescriptive text. That's the, the promises of God given to all who believe in Jesus Christ. You believe in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, and God gives you His Holy Spirit. And again, when you look at Acts, it kind of a lot of strange stuff happens because this is again, this is the beginning of the church. This is a new thing that's taken place. But the biblical teaching is that everyone who believes, you are forgiven and you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to take this time and debunk the two unbiblical distinctives of the Pentecostal movement. And I don't do this to just simply say, okay, I'm going to bash this group. I have, you know, I have friends that are Pentecostal. Um, I believe that you know, there are those that are that are truly saved. But I do think that there are some practices that are inconsistent with the teaching of Scripture. And, and, and as we debate these, and this isn't really an argument over cessationism and continuationism. In fact, and, and thanks to this uh, one Lutheran minister I listened to by the name of Chris Rosebro, he, he makes a really good point that I'm about to share with you today. Without even getting into that whole discussion of cessationism, he points out two unbiblical things that Pentecostal movement itself teaches. Those two things are namely this. There's a second baptism. And two, evidence of the second baptism is you get the gift of tongues. First thing to point out from Scripture, the Bible does not teach a second baptism. You look at Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says this, and in, in beginning with verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Again, one baptism, not two. And I point this out because unfortunately, and again, whether we're Pentecost or not, unfortunately, this false teaching of a second baptism creates a problem in, in church life where you have people who think, well, you have Christians and then you have super Christians. You know, there's everybody else and then these people, they get this extra blessing and that makes them, you know, better than everyone else. That's not biblical. We are all baptized with one baptism. We are all given the one Spirit of God. And, and as I mentioned with the prescriptive thing is, you know, when do we receive the Holy Spirit? Again, it happened differently through the book of Acts. But again, what does Peter say? When you believe, you receive forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. There isn't this different classes of Christians. We are all Christians. We all receive the Spirit of God. The other distinction that I mentioned was, again, and this is tied into the first, the idea that evidence of this second blessing or second baptism is speaking in tongues. And, and what they say is, again, if you have this blessing, you have speaking in tongues. That's for everyone who has this. The Bible itself, and this you can look at 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. And again, I'm not going to, I know I could talk for this for hours. And I'm, I'm just trying to keep it short today just to look at these two points. Um, the Bible clearly says when you look at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, the Bible clearly says that God empowers everyone differently with different gifts. It also points out, even in that, those texts, the gift of tongues is not a universal gift. It doesn't say everyone, believe, everyone gets this gift. It says some do. Some get others. Same Holy Spirit that fills all of us. 
But he manifests himself in different ways. And also when you read through 1 Corinthians 12, the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit are for the unity and edification of the church. You know, I mentioned these, like I said, I'm not just here trying to bash Pentecostals. I'm, I'm here because I think for us as the church, we need to recognize, one, there aren't separate classes. We are all Christians, and God has bestowed His Spirit on all of us. And God gives all of us gifts. And those gifts are all different. But it's the same God who gives us these gifts. And the purpose of these gifts is so that we would love each other, serve each other, build up the body of Christ, be boldly proclaim the gospel to those that are lost, so that the church of God may grow and be one people, united in Christ Jesus, to the glory of God the Father. I mentioned those distinctives that are, that are dangerous because it divides up the church. And it results in believers not properly understanding you know, that God has a purpose in each and every one of our lives. That He has gifted each and every one of us. Now maybe today you don't know what those gifts are. And I would definitely encourage you, read the Scriptures on the gifts of the Spirit. Pray that God would give you wisdom Look at, you know, even looking in, again, and all of this is in the context of the local church. Look at what, you know, what does the local church need? What are you passionate about? Being a Christian is, again, it's not a spectator sport. We, we are all members of one body. God has called us all together as one people that we might love and serve one another, encourage one another, help one another. We are independent on one another. And again, if you look at the 1 Corinthians, it talks about we're all members. We're all different and we need each other. And like I said, in looking at these two distinctives, you know, I mean, there's other, other things that are difficult to understand, other things to talk about, but I think those two points are enough. Um, even when you talk, you know, you talk about warfare, you don't have to win every battle. You just have to win the battles that matter. And these are the battles that matter. And my encouragement to, to everyone today in closing, again, as we reflect back on the events of Pentecost and God pouring out His Holy Spirit on His church, that he, he did it in a mighty way that the people would know that Jesus Christ was Lord. And even today, there are people that need to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and He has given us His Spirit to empower us, to carry out His purpose, to build His church. May we not quench the Spirit in our lives through sin, but may we fan into flame the gifts of the Spirit God has given us. May we love and serve one another that Jesus Christ be glorified in our church, in our community, in our country, and in the world. Fan into flame the gift of the Spirit that God has given you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are a powerful, a mighty, a loving God. And as we read through all of Scripture and we see all of these different events that transpire and we see all of the pieces that they fit together and they put together this picture of You and Your greatness that You have called each and every one of us as, as Your people to, to serve one another and to be used by You, that you, are, you have made us Your temple. That Your Spirit resides within us. That we might be used by You mightily in reaching the lost with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to be humble and submit to You. Give us the boldness and the abilities to, to do what You have called us to do as Your church. May we be one body, helping one another, 
united in our faith in Jesus Christ for your glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.